So church family, I'm going to ask you to stand and open your Bibles, if you would, this morning to Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. We're moving now, a whole new section. We're on our way. Yes, it may take months to go through this section, but we're moving into a new section. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. We're looking, believe it or not, and I'm going to ask you to pay close attention to this. We're looking at a message titled, What Are You Going to Do About Bible Prophecy? And you say, Jack, wait a minute. What kind of a title is that to Romans chapter 8, 31 to 39? Well, frankly, uh, it it addresses exactly where you and I are living today. Um, How much did Paul the Apostle know? Maybe a lot. I don't know. But when he wrote what we're about to read 2,000 years ago, uh, he knew that he was not only speaking to the believers in Rome, but he was going to be speaking to all those in history that would come to faith in Christ. So in a sense, this is a very prophetic word. Are you with me? to the church today. We're not reading exactly history. We're reading history and today and tomorrow as we look at this. Romans chapter 8. I'll begin in verse 31. If you guys pick it up in verse 32, Paul says, and I love it, you can almost see his arms be thrown up. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us as all, how shall he all things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine? or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. And we do ask God's good hand to be upon his word to us in an in a absolutely perfect biblical style, as, as you would expect from the Apostle Paul. He actually asks a question in verse 31. He says in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? This is a very, very biblical, classical way of teaching. He asks a question. In other words, he sets up a question. Why? Because he wants to give the answer. Are you with me on that? Granted, we ask questions because we want to get an answer. Paul is teaching under the influence of the Holy Spirit. He's speaking under the power of the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God prompts him to ask this question, which is very, very vital to us as believers in every generation. What shall we say then? If God be for us, who can be against us? And then he answers the very question in verse 32. He who, di- who, he who did not spare his own son, we're going to unpack that in a moment, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He answers in verse 32 the question he's asking in verse 31. It is a classic Jewish way of teaching. It is brilliant and it is powerful, invented by God. And of course, Jesus Christ was the exact master of that in his teaching style, not only with parables but the fact that Jesus taught expositionally through uh, books of the Bible, predominantly the book of Deuteronomy. We know this from the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy more than any other book, and you and I only get the parable. The way that the Hebrews teach, the Jews teach, they teach expositionally, line upon line, precept upon precept, but in our Gospels, you and I do not have the hour or two. You think you've got it rough for, for an hour. Jesus taught customary hour, two, maybe three hours, and then summed up the teaching like the Jews do. It's brilliant. To bring or to drive home the teaching, they wrapped it in what's called a parabolic delivery or parable. Everything he taught was then brought to your mind and your imagination 
in technicolor by a parable. And Jesus taught like that. And he taught by uh, asking questions. How many times did Jesus answer? Listen, he, somebody asked him a question. He said, well, let me ask you a question. Remember that? Yep. Anybody remember that? Yes. And then he would actually ask them a question to deliver the answer. They would ask him, he would ask him back, and then he would give the answer. It's absolutely awesome. It's brilliant. And uh, Solomon, the, the wisdom of God. The Bible tells us there's never been a man wiser than Solomon. Now, Solomon, uh, remember, he's a human. I mean, he had, he had, he had divine wisdom given to him. And uh, nobody, the Bible says, was ever wiser uh, no, uh, or shall be wiser than Solomon, unless, uh, of course, except Christ. But on earth as a man, and you know, Solomon made a lot of big dumb mistakes over life. Even in wisdom, he went against what he knew to be true. But this is the kind of wisdom that God gives. Do you guys remember when Solomon was seated upon his throne and there was uh, two women who had uh, equally born children? Uh, obviously, they were, the, they were the same gender, two little boys, moms are nursing, uh, they appear maybe to be friends, we're not sure about that, but um, one of them woke up to find out that uh, her, her baby was dead, and so she took the other baby from the mom that was sleeping and replaced them, and in the morning she said, oh look, tough, day, tough night, huh? Look, your baby's dead. She stole the woman's baby and then said, look, your baby's dead. And now she's got this other woman's baby. And so there's this, obviously, there's this big scandal about it. So they go to Solomon. Now think about this. We need wisdom today like this in our courts and in our leadership and our nation and in our cities and counties. Solomon is sitting there on his throne. The two women come up. Uh, they're weeping. They're arguing their case. One's got a dead baby. One's got a living baby. And Solomon says, okay, I got it. I got it. Calm down. Not a problem. He calls for a sword. Bring me a sword. And uh, he says, I'm going to cut the baby in half, and you can share the living baby. I'll just cut the living child in half, and you can take one part, and you can take the other part. There, problem solved. And the woman, one woman cried out and said, no, 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 no. She can have the baby. And Solomon says, give that, give that baby to that woman who just said that right now. That's her baby. Think of the wisdom of that. The power of that. And God speaks to us in the power of his word, the Bible. And it's alive. I'm going to give you a huge introduction. We may not even get into the study. But it is foundational. Very much so for this. Write it down if you would please. Revelation chapter 19 verse 10. We're talking about... Uh, what are we going to do about Bible prophecy? And yes, it has everything to do with the book of, of Romans. But right now, Revelation 19, verse 10. John says, I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, this is an angelic, uh, either an angelic creature or it's uh, somebody in heaven, one of our own brethren. See that you do not do that. I am a fellow servant and of your brethren. You ha who have the testimony of Jesus, this, this personage is speaking this to John, and he says, or they say, worship God. Here's the reason why. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The revelation of God's word is the very spirit of who Jesus Christ is, the foundation of the Bible. John chapter 16, verse 33. John 16, 33, the Bible says, and these things, Jesus said, I have spoken unto you. That in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And all God's people said, Amen. that's awesome. That's a promise you can hang on today. That's going to become more dear to you and I as the months advance. Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. The Bible says, And the angel of the church at Philadelphia write, I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door. And no one can shut it because you have a little strength and you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Because, verse 10 says, you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour. It's a very specific moment of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. There's a time of evil that is going to escalate so great 
that Jesus says, don't worry about it. For that generation of believers, I'm going to keep you from that hour that's going to test the entire world. We need to remember that because where we're going in Romans chapter 8. Isaiah 42, verse 9. Isaiah 42, 9. God says, behold, the former things have come to pass. I love that. What I've said in prophecy, look, it was just fulfilled. That's what God's saying. And new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. That's the God of the Bible, church. The Bible is the only prophetic book in all of human history. All of the, listen, everything else is a knockoff. Everything else is, is an attempt to act like the Bible, to be like the Bible. And they all fail. They all fail, every single one of them. They all fail. But the Bible is the only prophetic book in the world. God tells the future in advance. It's one of the attributes that he says that makes him God, but also is one of the attributes by which you can determine if he is God. He tells the future perfectly. Regarding Romans 8 and Bible prophecy, the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 says, for our citizenship is in heaven. Friends, that's a prophetic statement. Our citizenship is in heaven. This means we're not home yet. We're on our way home. We're going home. By the way, just, just for the Bible student around here today, the Greek word for citizenship is politics. Isn't that fun? For our politics is in heaven. What does that mean? I don't care if you're an independent, Republican, or Democrat, okay? It's worthless. Personally, I'm a monarchist. Oh, that's kind of, sounds kind of, what is that? That means I believe in a ruling, reigning king. His name happens to be Jesus, and I'm waiting for him to come back at any time. My citizenship, and I trust yours is as well, is because heaven is where our politics rules and reigns from. And that is the very seat of the throne of Jesus Christ himself. What an awesome thing that is. What a great thing. The Bible also tells us, that um, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, verses 1 to 4, then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, testing Jesus, asking uh, if he would show them a sign from heaven. And Jesus answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, because the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites. I love how subtle he is. Hypocrites, the word hypocrite in Greek means you two-faced individual. That's why in Hollywood, the Screen Writers and Actors Guild is the two hypocrites. One face is smiling, one face is frowning, and the actor wears both. Jesus says, you bunch of actors. You think you know everything, but you tell, you, you get the weather report. But he goes on to say, you can't even discern the times and the seasons in which you live. He says, you hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign shall be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Amen. Isn't that awesome? Amen. You say, what? Jonah, the big whale? No. The Bible says Jonah and the big fish it wasn't a whale, it was a fish. You believe that story? I believe it because it's not a story, it's a fact. Who says? Jesus says. Amen. Jesus says it's not a story. Jesus says it's real. And Jesus says, so will be my death and resurrection. You want to see a sign? I'll show you a sign. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Amen. That was the sign he gave. So number one, church, we dive into our point today. It's the only point we have. It's in verses 31 to 32, and it's very important. What are you going to do about Bible prophecy? Because you're living in it, if you realize it or not, right now. So what are you going to do about it? Wake up and realize this, that the fact is your glorification, Christian, is coming. We studied that in Romans chapter 8 earlier. We looked at it in verses 28, 29, and 30. And God says that his intent is ultimately to bring you and I, those of us who trust Christ, to glory. Isn't that amazing to think? It's funny because everybody wants glory. So when I mention glory in the Christian setting, it's like, now calm down, pastor. 
But everybody wants glory. They want to be in the front seat of the of the parade, they want to have all the, the trophies, they want to walk down the red carpet, they want their name in neon, and then when it comes to the actual glory, we as Christians shy away from it. Well, you need to be humble now. We're talking about humility. This is the glory that God gives. This is not the glory based on your achievements. Remember, we talked about last week, foreknowledge and predestination engineered by God. He did it all. You're not going to walk into heaven and say, hey, everybody, how you doing? You're going to walk in and we're going to say, how did you get here? <laughs> and all of our answers are going to be the same, by the grace of God, by the awesome, incredible merits of Christ Jesus, none of our own doing. And God says, I've not only foreordained you, but I predestined you, I called you, and he ends that gr the glorious purpose of it all, last week we saw, is that we're going to be glorified in eternity. So walking down the red carpet, that's a joke, who cares? Oh, you know what, we'll put your name up in lights. Oh, forget it. But to have your name on the roster of heaven, and for God to announce... For you, whatever your name is, Betty, uh, Barney, Fred, Wilma, enter into the joy of the Lord. Imagine that is going to be absolutely awesome. The glorification of the believer, it says in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? You've got to see Paul's Jewishness in this. If you know any Jewish people, you can hear it. It's awesome. When he says, what then shall we say to these things? Um... He's asking a question, and he's going to give you the answer. It's not like he's asking a question, and he's wiping the sweat from his brow, and he's kind of in a panic. What shall we say to these things? Oh, no. He's throwing out a question, because he's setting you up for the answer. What shall we say to these things? You can hear him. So, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Is that, look, is there a question on the other end? Is there a question sign on the other end of that? Yes, there is. Look. What then shall we say to these things? Question mark. If God is for us, who can be against us? Question mark. He just answered the question with a question. <laughs> Apparently, that's the way the Holy Spirit works. How many times does God answer your question with a question? Lord, I don't know what to do. And God says, do you think that person in front of you right there, hungry, with their hand out, means nothing? Question mark. You see, God answers often with a question. I want all my questions answered, the man says. Well, just get ready. Because God's going to answer your questions with questions. He did it with Job. Job's asking all these questions in his time of trouble. And God says to Job, stand up and quit whining. I'm going to ask you some questions now and answer me. He didn't even give Job an option. God, can you imagine God saying to you, you will stand up and you will answer me. Does that terrify you? It terrifies me. Wow. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, listen to this, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Do you see a question mark? There it is. <laughs> God gave his son on the cross for our sins to answer the very cry of the human heart and what Jesus purchased on the cross and his resurrection from the dead guarantees God answering your question if you're honest enough to ask yourself the question, can I know God? Is heaven real? What am I going to do about my sin? Does God really set people free? Oh, the answer is a glorious yes. The fact is, my friend, God is at work in our coming glorification, Christian. So what are you going to do about Bible prophecy? Number one, mark this down. Verse 31 is this. We will learn the truth. We will learn it happily with joy. We will learn it. We're learning it now. We will learn the truth. So when he says... What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, stop right there. Circle the words, these things. This is awesome. 
Because the word these things encompass technically everything from Romans chapter 1 verse 1 all the way to this moment. It's the entire, we would say, authorship or speech or message that Paul has given to this moment. And then Paul says to all that I've taught you about and spoken to you about, what shall we say to these things? But watch this. It also means regarding this fantastic revelation of last study, and that is, if God's foreknowledge is such that he predestined you to be his child, he called you, you love him, that's proof of the spirit in you, you cannot love God on your own, it's the Holy Spirit who prompts your heart to love God, it's all of God. And God gives us the opportunity in his creation to make you and I sovereign enough under his watchful care, knowing though in advance foreknowledge that when the gospel would be preached, you would say yes. You don't get any points for saying yes, church, by the way. You understand that? So, oh, I'm in heaven. It's a good thing I said yes. Listen, God gave you the ability to understand his gospel truth, and for you to accept that truth, he gave the ability to do it. Here's the awesome thing. God provided the way of salvation. You didn't. Everybody in heaven is flat on their face, giving praise, honor, and glory to God with great thanks. And it's always, by the way, foreknowledge and predestination is always in the positive in the scriptures. Always. Never in the negative. I can argue with you from the Bible to show you that God in his foreknowledge has predestined those who are his children. But nowhere in the Bible can I show you that God in his foreknowledge predestined people to not be his children. Isn't that interesting? That upsets a lot of people when they have a particular denominational persuasion. But the Bible says what it says. We learn the truth. And that truth that he just got done speaking to us about, look at it again, and it's on the screens, Romans chapter 8, 28. And if we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, verse 29, for, ho- for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, the, the preeminent one Christ is, among many brethren, his brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. We studied the meaning of that last time. And whom he justified, these he also, what is the word? Glorified. glorified. Yes. All this is to God's delight. Remove yourself from it. Yes. Well, pastor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a Christian when I just straighten up my act. It had never happened. Forget it. Stop it. That's Satan whispering to you. Just improve yourself. Think about how sick that is. Improve yourself. You can't improve yourself. Because at what point will Satan allow you or yourself, forget about Satan, at what point would you say about yourself that you've arrived and now you're ready to... Enter, the, enter into the gospel truth. No, by nature, the Spirit of God condemns us outside of Christ. We're never good enough. Thank God we were never asked to be, to be good enough. We're never to be called to be good enough. We are called to agree with him who in his foreknowledge and predestination has established you to be a child of God. You say, Pastor, this is so confusing. No, really it's not. Are you ready? Here it goes. Get get ready. All of you who have been, based on God's foreknowledge, predestined to be his child, you want Jesus Christ to govern your life. You want him in your life. If you would today say, I want Jesus to rule my life, well, you can thank God that in his foreknowledge you were predestined. But my husband, he doesn't want anything to do with that. Well... God knew throughout all time and eternity that when your husband heard the gospel, he wouldn't want it. Based on God's, God knew, God knew from ancient, ancient as it were eternity that when you had the opportunity, you would say no and you'd keep saying no and like Pharaoh, you'd say no so long that you are now stuck in it and you don't even want to get out of it. Listen, here's a weird truth. It is truth, but it's weird. People who are in hell, they don't want to be in heaven. It's hotter than hockey sticks there where they're at, but not enough for them to want to go to heaven. Think about that. They didn't want to go to heaven. And by default, man who is lost winds up in hell. 
There are those who say, I don't want to go to hell. And I believe that Christ died for me and rose again from the dead. Praise God. That's the truth. And the fact of the matter is, God for you has got glorification in mind. You're going to ultimately be shed from this body. Say amen. Amen. Those of us who are over 45, I'm only 46 myself, ministry takes its toll. No. No. But you know, when your body starts hurting and you're a Christian, it's like, thank God. You, you pick up the, the morning news, so to speak, or you read it, and you look around at the globe. I get all the, not all, but I get, I don't know, probably close to 80 world headlines of the day, and the world's nuts. Yes. And I look at it, and everybody's wringing their hands about, it's all falling apart. And it's like, and the Christian, we just look at it and say, wow, it's all coming together, just as God said it would be. The truth, remarkable. And by the way, what a great thing it is because we're going to be talking, as we've read a moment ago, about glorification in the midst of hardships and difficulties, trials and tribulations. And the fact of the matter is, it's all about God's power of truth being governing in your life. This is why somebody would rightly say that one with God is a majority. That sounds like a dumb statement. But theologically, it's true. God, listen up, cheer up. God always moves the greatest in the minority. From Genesis to Revelation, it's always the few in number that see the miraculous works of God. This is the way he works. Remember, David got in big trouble because he was going to go to war, but he counted the troops to see, oh, they've got a bazillion soldiers. We're going to go up against them. Let's count and see how many soldiers we have. And God says, David, boy, are you in trouble? You need to come over here. And God sent David to the woodshed for a come to Jesus meeting. And, and it was not good. Because of David's sin, people died. What was David supposed to do? Lord, you don't care about numbers. You know, look, this is one service today. There's going to be three churches here today at this address by the end of the day. And this is one of them. And it's full. And there's overflow. You think God cares about numbers? He doesn't care about that. He doesn't look down and say, wow, look what's going on there. No, you know what he says? He says, watch out. Watch out. Because when a mustard seed begins to sprout and grows into a tree, excuse me, mustard seeds don't grow into trees. Jesus is warning us. When a mustard seed grows into something abnormally large, he says, It's then that the birds of the air come and lodge in its branches. In Hebrew teaching, birds of the air, birds generic is a warning. For example, when Jesus says, a sparrow, when it falls to the ground, your father cares. Did Jesus say when the birds fall to the ground, your father cares? Nope. He mentions sparrow by identification. When the Bible mentions birds generic, it's always bad. When the church grows from a little mustard seed, 12 guys... Well, 12, lost one, 11, then got one back. <laughs> it grows, and, and, and because God's blessing it, evil will infiltrate like birds hiding in a tree. You know, think, sorry if this offends you, but to me, this is very powerful. I've never had to cover my head walking underneath a bush when there's birds in it. I've always had to be concerned about covering my head when I'm walking under a tree when it's full of birds. Think of that picture in your head. Because in the midst of the church, there's going to be imposters. In the midst of this service, numerically, there'll be those who have no intention to draw closer to Jesus in this service. They have no inclination whatsoever to let the authority of God take over their lives. They're here for mischief. God knows this. We don't know it. I don't think we know it. But watch out for numbers. Numbers don't say anything about what's right. Be very careful about that. God's math is best when it's one person standing on God's truth with God. And it's not two. It's not God and us. When we stand on his word, we're one with him. That's God's math. Elijah stood against the false prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth, 850 prophets and one man standing against them, speaking truth. And God defeated 850 prophets 
Why? Elijah stood true to the word of God. Number two is this, verse 31, is that we see the opposition. What are you going to do about Bible prophecy in our day, right now, in the 21st century, in this year? What are we going to do? Well, just keep your eyes on the fact, Christian, that God has got glorification coming for you. You you are going to inherit the glory of God. None of us can imagine what that's like. And I had a dream and I saw the glory of God. I don't want to hear it. No, seriously, with all due respect, you saw the glory of God? Paul the Apostle said he saw it, and God forbade him to tell other people about it. If Paul the Apostle couldn't talk about it, I don't think you're clear to speak on it. You don't have that clearance. Paul had it, and he couldn't talk about it. Did you know that? Paul saw the glory of heaven. And you could almost feel it when he's saying, I saw... And then he says, but he was not permitted to write or to speak of it. It's almost like as though Paul picked up his quill to start writing, and the Spirit of God said, what are you going to write? What are you going to say to these things? It's too glorious. Can you imagine trying to find a word? I wish I would have done my homework better. It just came into my mind. But I would have put it on the screen. It would freak you out. Maybe I'll do it at second service, but it's... um. No, no, you, don't you stay. You go to, you leave. <laughs> we love you, but when this service is over, get out. We have a whole nother group coming in. <laughs> but someone, some uh, Christian group, somebody read out loud to AI Ezekiel's chapters describing angels in heaven. And the AI was listening like it's listening now, truly. And the AI produced what and how it saw the description of angels given in the Bible. And it will shock every single one of you. It shocked me. It it had no resemblance of what I thought when I read the Bible. And the AI took just the words of the Bible and then put in graphic form what it was. Wings with eyes covering them within and without. What does that mean? Well, AI, even AI blew my mind, but AI doesn't know. When it talks about a wheel within a wheel... And each angel having one head, but with four faces on one head. Figure that out. The glories of heaven. Remarkable. But listen, we will see the opposition. We will learn the truth. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, friends, that's enough. If God is for you. Then what about the opposition? If God is for us, who can be against us? Can you all understand this right now? That verse, verse 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Do you, you do understand that this is what it doesn't say. If God is for us, nobody's against us. That's not what the Bible says. If God is for us, who can be against us? Listen, if God is for us, then the world will be against you. That's what it means. But without effect. Because you think about it. If God be for us, who can be against us? We in our Western world way of thinking think, well, if I'm a Christian, everybody's going to love me. That's not what the Bible says. In fact, if you're a Christian, the world's going to be against you. But the Bible makes it clear, what can they do to us? If God is for us, who can be against us? If God is for us, All those who are against us, because we're biblically based, amount to nothing. Do you know that? Do you believe that? I believe that with all my heart, and if I didn't, I'd walk off this platform today. The magnitude and the amount of criticism that this church gets for standing and holding the line, and I don't care. Well, this this is what, an article, this is what this pastor is teaching, and he's bullying, and and it's not true. So what do I get to do? I get to laugh at it. Why do you do that? I'm just following the instructions of my father. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. He will hold them, the unbeliever, in derision. 
Do you know the truth? Are you walking after the truth? When you quote Jesus and when you love your family who hates you back and you're kind to them, doesn't it drive them crazy? When they are trying to provoke you to wrath but you love them, you know what it does to them? It's what Jesus said by heaping coals of fire on their head. They're trying to upset you, but you bless them back. Heaping coals of fire is a blessing. It's not a curse. You're giving them what they need to have food and light and comfort and safety. Coals of fire, that's how they carried fire from one neighbor's house to the next, was in a basket on their head. Jesus said, if there's people upsetting you and stuff, or if somebody has need, then listen, if they revile you, bless them back by heaping coals of fire on them. It doesn't mean catch their hair on fire. It means that give them fire so that they can go feed their kids and warm, and warm their house. But they hate me. Give them good. Bless those who curse you. You know why? We're not taking it personal. I was invited to something recently. I think I told you guys this before, a couple of weeks ago. I was invited and I was being, as I was en route, I got this little briefing and they said, hey, just a heads up, this thing you're coming to, uh, you are hated here. <laughs> and I said, I appreciate, thanks for the intel. I, that's what I just, hey, thanks for the intel, copy that, okay, good. And the th- why, why, why does that help me? Because listen, none of them are going to attack you and me because we're wearing the wrong shoes or the wrong shirt or we didn't get the note about what color pants we're all supposed to wear. If people hate you for Jesus' sake, if you can say, this is why they don't like me, they try to provoke me and I love them back. They yell and scream and I don't go back at them like that. I pray for them. Opposition. Only in Christianity is opposition a tool that God works through in your life and mine. Man, like with Joseph, his brothers meant it for evil, did they not? And decades later, Joseph had the great opportunity to say to them, I know you guys intended this for evil, but God meant it for good. The Bible says that God will take the wrath of man in the day of judgment and it will praise his name. Wow, what does that mean? I don't know, but we'll see it. If God is for us, who can be against us? The word against here in the Greek language means any accusation. Listen, church, any accusation, indictment, attack, defamation, condemnation, any judgment with the intent to destroy or malign or to slander. You don't have to worry about those that are against you. Live prophetically. Joshua chapter 1 verse 5 starts there. No man, are you guys okay? No man shall be able to stand against you or before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Well, listen, if he was with Moses and if if he was with Joshua, then I take it that he's going to be with me. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage. For to this people you shall be divided as an inheritance, the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The life of the Christian today. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 19. They will fight against you. God tells Jeremiah, they're going to fight against you, Jeremiah. He said, wait, I I thought I was called by God. You are Jeremiah. I thought you loved me, God. I do love you. I thought I was in the ministry. You are full time. He says, they will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, says the Lord, to deliver you. I love that. I love that verse. Jeremiah 1, 9. Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 6. You have set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death. God's commitment to us. No need to fear opposition. Church family, listen up. No need to fear the opposition that's coming, and it is coming. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. So he answered and said, do not fear, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. That is the enemy. 
You can't see the invisible realm. When you're standing all alone, you can't see the invisible forces that are around you. I wonder how many things go on in our life that we just fluff off as nothing. Little do we know that there is God's influence going on. Psalm 118. You guys okay? There's a lot of verses. I hope you're writing these down. Psalm 118, verse 6. The Lord is, my, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. Are you going to go to court? Are you going to go before the city council? Are you going to go before the whatever, the panel, the board? The Lord is on my side. I will not fear what can man do to me. And then thirdly is this, closing is this. We will know his favor. We get that in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him... That is, how shall the Father, not with Christ the Son, also freely give us, what? All things. things. That's an answer with a question on it. Do you see that? Brilliant. God's favor. God's favor. This is a very technical verse. When it says, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up, doesn't it sound like God threw his son to the dogs, so to speak, and walked away? Maybe like this. He threw his son to destruction so that he might get us out of it? That's what it sounds like, but that's not what's happening. The whole act of biblical atonement and redemption, what is known theologically as propitiation, demands an agreement between the one that is doing the offering and the one that is being offered. Are you hearing me? Amos 3.3 says, how can two walk together unless they're in agreement? And we see that lived out in the life of Abraham and Isaac, going to Mount Moriah, both of them in full agreement to the top of the mountain. And even when Abraham tells Isaac, you're going to be slain, translation, but God will raise you up. That young man could have overpowered his father. By the way, you'll read that in A.W. Tozer's book, The Pursuit of God, powerfully. It's almost as though Tozer gets inside of the skin of that old man and it says on a a night on a hilltop, Abraham battles it out with his God over the sacrifice of his son. Did not Jesus battle it out in the Garden of Gethsemane? Did you notice when you read the account of Christ's crucifixion, arrest and crucifixion, that everything after the Garden of Gethsemane is all downhill. I mean that with all due respect. Everything's downhill from there. Did you notice that? Jesus is crying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's lamenting. He's speaking to his Father, and he speaks the unthinkable. Father, if there's any other way for this cup to be removed from me, remove it. I don't want to go to the cross in my flesh. My body is screaming fear. I don't want to feel the pain. If there's any other way for man to be saved, let this cup pass from me. That's what he's praying. And there's no answer from heaven. God had already given him the answer. Christ in his flesh in that moment, think about it. He's got the same flesh that you and I have. And he had to battle that. And then when the Bible tells us that after the third time, the angels came and strengthened him, and Jesus said, Just moments before that. Not my will, but thy will be done. And the moment he prayed that prayer, without an answer, God answered him. And Jesus got up and took total control. Peter, James, guys, get up, let's go. He goes to the garden, he's arrested, he's in total control all along the way. Are you aware of that? The very God who loved you and died on the cross for you was in total control. Jesus was not murdered. Jesus wasn't killed. It was no accident. Hildebrand writes that he was the reluctant Messiah. What an insult. Jesus says, for this reason came I into the world, but to die for us. And the Bible here tells us, in the great plan of God, he who did not spare his own son. What does this translate to? Absolute love for you. But delivered him up for who? For us all. How shall he, God the Father, not with Christ the Son, also freely give us all things? So here's where we end. 
So when he says, he who did not spare his own son, I have this question for you. Does Romans 8.28 apply to Jesus as it applies to you? Think. I'm vetting this in front of you. I read it in no book, but as I was praying and studying, the thought came to my mind. If God the Father offered up God the Son on the cross for me, and he suffered as he did, listen, class, this is advanced theology now, does not the entire Bible reveal to us the perfect will of God? Did not Jesus say, I have come to fulfill the entire word of God? Is this not an eternal truth that God, if he loves us, if his son is born into the world, loves his son, doesn't Jesus say so? Father, you have loved me. I love you. And these who follow me, they love you and you love them as I love them. In John 17, remarkable. When the Bible says, all things work together for good to those who love God, go do some homework. How many times did Jesus say, I love God. I love my Father. And then he turns and says, do this. Love my Father. Love God. All of that is the fulfillment of Scripture. Love your neighbor. Love God. Love God. Love your neighbor. Never ends. So the question is this. He gave his only son... But is the truth not there that God would experience all things work together for good to those who love God? Speaking of Christ now. I'm not, I'm not just speaking to him. I'm speaking of Christ. You say, I don't know. I've got to think about that one. Well, here's the answer. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame. Jesus died and suffered death and it was a joy for him in the spirit to offer himself up for us. Amen. He loves you that much. For 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich for your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. Did you hear that? I want to ask you this question. Are you becoming rich? Are you becoming wealthy? You say, well, not, not in this current market and climate. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. I'm, I'm, talking about, um, I'm talking about being rich. You know, like wealthy? Like, like, what do you mean? Like, this is what I mean. How rich are you in forgiveness? Well, I got a lot of stocks, got a lot of bonds. How rich are you in forgiveness? How much grace is in your account right now? I love God. Do people who know you know how rich you are by the amount of grace in your account? How much mercy have you deposited lately in the bank? Because, you know, you can only draw off of what you have in the bank, you know. God doesn't use a credit card that has to be carried over. How rich are you in love? How about this one? What about peace? Are you rich with the peace of God? I'm talking about peace. When you see people invading your country or you hear the doctor give you the news about your nine-year-old or one of our dear precious saints this morning waking up to find his wife having passed in the night this morning. With hot tears on his cheeks, weeps with a smile. Go figure that one. Lifelong marriage, lifelong life. Started with us in this church when we were home Bible study. Wakes up to find his wife with Jesus. She, <laughs> I like to put it this way. She left her friend for another man. <laughs> His name happens to be Jesus, and I don't mean Jesus. I'm talking about Jesus. So I'd like to ask you today, if you'd like to make a deposit for the first time in a brand new account, 
Because right now you have zero in that account. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. No, 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 wait. Let's not do that. That would mess things up. Stay seated. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Nobody moves. Guns are set to tase. Doors are locked. Your desire to get your grill out of this parking lot could interrupt somebody's decision to meet Christ. That would be wrong. I'm going to ask you right now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, to make a decision right now about this God who loves you. And he's asking you a question. What are you going to do about the future? What are you going to do about prophecy, the Bible? It will come to pass, but will you be there with us? How rich are you? Is your life abounding with grace and forgiveness, love and mercy? Do you want it to be? I'm going to ask you today to make a deposit into the bank of God. And I'm going to ask you to put yourself there. God doesn't want your money. He wants you. You know the part you're hanging on to the most? Sure, you'll write a check for a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars or a couple ten thousand dollars. That's easy. That's easy. You write that thing. It doesn't hurt anything. It comes from all of your abundance. God doesn't want it. He wants you. And see, there is the hang up. He wants you to step inside the offering bag, as it were. Heavenly Father, I pray in this moment of decision that people would make a decision for you right now, that they would say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, as we sing this song, I'm going to ask you to get up and come forward. And this is what you're getting up and come forward for. That you are by getting up saying, I am giving my life to Christ publicly. I'm, gonna, I'm making it my life as a deposit into God's bank in heaven where moth and rust and thieves cannot break in and steal. I am now going to deposit my very existence into the hands of the Almighty God. I want my sins forgiven and I want a new life. We're going to sing this song and if you agree, you don't need anybody to poke you along or to help you if you believe that's true from the Bible, you get up and don't, don't take a vote. Don't test the air. Have conviction, will you? Christ died for you. You can stand for him and you can come forward and accept him as Lord and Savior. You come as we sing this song. You come right now in this time of getting ready to pray. If any of you are still thinking, I should really be doing this, then you should do that. Maybe you're watching us right now at home or you're on TV watching us or by whatever means. And in a moment, you're going to have the opportunity to scan a barcode and get a Bible and to find out what it's like to experience being in the family of God. But maybe you are, again, watching by TV or by whatever means, and you'd like to join these who are saying yes to Christ. You can do that right where you're at right now. You can pull over, you can stand, you can, wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, you can join these that are standing here. You can do the same thing right where you're at. Those of you who are here, will you pray this prayer out loud? God will hear you. You just mean it to him. And it is this. Church, you want to join in with them if you want. But those of you standing, pray this. Dear Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask you to wash me of my sins because I repent today. I'm a sinner asking you to save me. Change my life. Write my name in your book. I surrender. Come in now and begin to live in me. Because today I proclaim Jesus Christ crucified and risen from the dead. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.